want to thank our sponsors. Justforpolice.com, a grassroots service reward program established for police officers buying and selling real estate. Jiu-Jitsu50.com, a lifestyle brand training resource for law enforcement officers, providing technique videos, blog articles, promoted courses, and the latest in apparel and gear. Jiu-Jitsu50.com. Storm Training and Consulting, offering courses in firearms, tactical emergency medicine, and the Tactical Rescue Challenge. Stormtraining.org. Manchester Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, a.k.a. Bushido, located in Manchester, Connecticut, a staple in the Jiu-Jitsu community for over 20 years. ManchesterBJJ.com. Welcome back to The Code. Got Rich McKeegan, a.k.a. The Scarecrow, with me from his... uh layer again in the basement with all his UFC, you know, people behind him. How's it going there, Rich? Man, we had a, a nice break this past weekend of some like nice weather and then it snowed yesterday. Yeah. I'm I just, like, I'm, hopefully that's it. That's yeah. it. So it, this is lucky yeah, for 13 for you. People. We're up to 13 uh, episodes. So uh, kind of interesting. And um, this next one I'm really, uh, really excited for because uh, obviously our first episode was, was Professor Sauer. Um, and then, um, from there, we've had a bunch of people and now number 13 here, we have, uh, Jeff Curran who, um, you know, he was on all the videos, white to blue, blue to purple that all the members watch. And, you know, I got to ask him about that because it must be weird for him when all these people kind of feel like they know him and cause watch those videos so much. Jeff, how you doing? Uh, I'm doing great. Um, you know, yes, <laughs> we can talk about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm just happy to be on. This is great. You know, anything we could do um to stay connected in jiu-jitsu during this is i'm down for so i'm i'm happy i'm able to do it i was looking forward to doing this live like i think march 14th ish when i was supposed to be out by you guys um and i remember messaging you a couple of days before leaving saying i think i better stay home and then just like that the world shut down so kind of good you didn't get stuck with me for all that time <laughs> Yeah, that was uh, a lot of people were excited to have you come out. Um, we've never had you out at our school before. Um, I'm not even sure if I've seen you come up to New England in, in recent times, but um, definitely we, we want to reschedule that once this all settles. Yeah, that would be awesome. Uh, I've, been, I've been to the Mohegan Sun a lot um, in Connecticut, but I've always just been out there to compete. I've never, been, uh, I've never been out there to teach or to train. I've been out there for some fights and – uh, I've been, obviously I've been to Boston and things like that, but um, yeah, it's, I like to get up there to actually get on the mat and train and teach rather than just be stressed about a fight or cornering a fighter or something like that. Yeah. Mohegan Sun is about uh, from my house, it's about 30 minutes from my academy, my Manchester Academy, where you were going to come. It's about uh, 45 minutes to an hour, but um, okay. yeah. So uh yeah, we get a lot of, lot of, you know, mixed martial arts people come through the state because of that uh, location with the fights happening there and stuff. You know, and you mentioned obviously being involved in MMA and, you know, uh, I'm going to jump right into it. Basically, you started training as a kid in wrestling and taekwondo, worked your way into jiu-jitsu, and then at some point decided, hey, I'm going to go out there and fight MMA. And obviously, you started before me in jiu-jitsu, but back when we started or when I started a few years after you, you know, jiu-jitsu training, at least where I started, was much differently than it is now. It, we had strikes in class. <laughs> you know, it seemed like we, we, we fought, you know, even with the gi, you'd grab the gi and hit and what gi, no gi. It, was that what it was like for you when you first started too? Was there a mixture of both striking and, and, uh, and the grappling? And what led you to finally say, I want to step in a cage? Um, you know, I, yeah, the first, I was, I was like in a, on a mission to, find like real martial arts. I was training um, every chance I could. I would like get a magazine or a book and like study Bruce Lee and Jeet Kune Do. And I was just so into effectiveness. I didn't really ever want to do like sport karate or sport Taekwondo. Um, I got in trouble a lot when I would train in karate sparring because a little bit too much contact. Uh, and coming from that I wrestled because I wrestled at the same time during that, I liked being in, you know, engaged and stuff like that. But, you know, I started training jujitsu and I think late 91, early 92 and the UFC didn't come out until I think November of 93 or something like that. 
And when it came out, that was the first time I thought any, before that I wanted to be a boxer. I wanted to do something that had involved, like I used to watch the Sabaki challenge. Remember the full combat karate? Oh yeah. Yep. Kind of so, yeah. So they used to seek out anything that felt like real to me. And you're, yeah, we were kind of torn during that era, right? Because we were all, and you probably remember this, just you wanted realistic, but you also just wanted to be able to do something. And, and that's where I was at. As I said, a karate school that like, I knew the Korean guy we trained under was pretty hardcore, but I also knew he was in it for business. And I also knew that a lot of the stuff we were doing wasn't really street effective. And when I took my first ground fighting class, we should call it, because that's the way it was advertised. Um, Adam Miller, one of my, one of my black belts and Pedro Sauer black belts, he was a, I think a black belt in Hapkido at the time and his school that he was at sent him to a seminar with uh, Hickson. And he went to a Hickson Gracie seminar in downtown Chicago. And then he started teaching this like Wednesday night class. And I was able to get out there and I went, I went to a Wednesday night class and learned a whole bunch of moves in one night, just like arm submissions and things like that. And then uh, from there, we just all dug in and grappled and tried to hit each other. And I think the Gracie in action videos were popping out and then uh, the UFC came out and that was when I was just like, okay, there's got to be a way for me to be able to do this. Uh, never really about money or anything like that. Just, I wanted to fly the flag and I wanted to feel that intensity that went with it. So I don't know, I, right place, right time. And then as soon as the opportunity presented itself, I was, I was off and running. Now you were, it's like before you even started MMA, were you, you were boxing already, weren't you? I was boxing, um, when I grew up, I was training to box uh, with my grandpa and I was getting ready for like the silver gloves and my mom would not let me. So she told me I couldn't go get punched and all this stuff. But because of that, she allowed me to wrestle. So I went back to wrestling and uh, it just kind of sometimes park district karate and then sometimes in a wrestling camps. And then I would go do like fourth, fifth, sixth seventh eighth grade wrestling and then i started i think seventh grade getting pretty serious with like karate and taekwondo and training all the time and by the time freshman year came like i was just i was exposed to this jujitsu stuff and i went out and bought every single magazine i could and i looked for anything that had to do with the brazilian anything that had to do with a gracie and we found out that megaton was doing a seminar in calumet city indiana just out of side of chicago and we went to this three hour seminar with probably a hundred people. And I remember warming up for like an hour. And then one at a time, we all, all hundred people got to fight him and his purple belt, Sharon, and they would tap you out and then you'd get back in line. So basically for three hours, I just waited to get tapped out. And uh, man, I didn't learn anything, but I just, I learned that I like, like this stuff. So he gave me his business card and then I started flying out to Arizona and, Took about 30 trips to Arizona throughout my high school life. And uh, then we had a falling out when I was uh, 17 years old. And he just kind of, the way he treated me then was totally uncalled for. Um, so I started training with Carlson Gracie and I got my blue belt under Carlson Jr. in Chicago. And after that, uh, he, first of all, it's almost a two hour drive for me to get downtown Chicago. And I had a really old van. It didn't work well. It was like a 1979 carpet van and I was laying carpet all day long and then training at night. And uh, what happened was junior before cell phones and all that junior moved away and he moved to uh, Cincinnati. And then I just felt like, well, if I don't have a black belt to train under, then why am I driving all the way out here? Uh, even though I have great training partners and good teachers, uh, the Vienna brothers, Pedro and Daniel Vienna, um, Hey, Giago, he's, he was a brown belt. Then he moved to LA when junior left. So I started kind of looking like, where do I go to find somebody that can mentor me along? And that's when I met Frank Cucci at a seminar and at a Thai boxing seminar in Chicago. And he said, Oh man, you got to come out and meet this Pedro Sauer guy. And that was it. So I was 18 years old. I flew out to Virginia beach
Now, he was was, technically still in Utah at the time, right? Yes, he was in Utah for many years after that. Um, He was – he didn't move to Virginia till um, I don't remember the particular year, but I, I went, I started traveling to Utah all the time and uh, Pedro had an apartment above his garage. So I could live in that apartment. Um, sometimes I stayed with um, other friends. Other times if the apartment was rented out, then I would maybe get a hotel or an extended stay or something like that. But uh, just lots of traveling and, um, you know, I stayed with Anibal. You guys know Anibal in the association, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anibal Lobo. Yeah. He's, yeah, so he had a house and he was living out there and training all the time. And uh, he was a, a purple belt then. And uh, yeah, we just, we just trained. Pedro had schools all over Utah. He had Salt Lake City. He had Park City, um, like a little affiliate running there in Park City. Uh, now Mike Diaz has Park City, but uh, just had a little, and then Provo, Utah, like Provo Orem area where his house was, he had a little club. So it was cool. Cause I could just kind of travel around with him and wherever he went, I got to train with different people and stuff like that. So that's incredible. Busy times. How much it's interesting. You started with like a, a megaton, but and you said it's a bad experience at the end of how it dissipated. How has that impacted how you run your Academy today? Well, you know, it's, so the, the story kind of in a nutshell was I had this friend uh, that I was training with this kid, Tom, he was the one who introduced me to going to this Wednesday night class. And he was, he was so into training with Megaton as I was. And, you know, he kind of felt like he was a grade younger than me and he felt responsible for like making the hookup between me and him and Megaton and everybody. And we were just, we trained like crazy together. Like we were, he was my size and we were just very close, but his parents wouldn't let him um, kind of the way I see it. His parents wouldn't let him travel to Arizona anymore. I think he was kind of upset or bothered that I was able to go. And I had the kind of the freedom to do what I wanted because my house, my home life was such a mess. I could do what I wanted. And uh, thankfully I was choosing good things, but uh, so in the process of this, I got wind that Carlson Gracie was opening up in Chicago. And I remember being at Megaton's house. I lived with Megaton. I had a, I had a room there. I was there when, when uh, Mackenzie was born. I remember when she was a little baby, I used to hold Mackenzie Dern and feed her and she'd climb on the table. And like, that's the time that I was there. Well, we were sitting in a hot tub outside of, in his backyard in his house and, and, Phoenix. And, um, I said, Hey, you know, do you know Carlson jr? And he's Carlson Gracie jr. He said, yeah, you know, we competed together in judo or something like that. And I know who he is. I said, well, you know, I, since I can only travel here every so often, he's going to be in Chicago. Do you think it's worthwhile for me to train with him, uh, when I'm home? And I, he said, yeah, you know, you can do that, whatever, but you know, like blah, blah, blah. And he was very short with me. Well, I went back and told my friend, hey, uh, I think that I'm going to start going down and training in Chicago and I'll learn some stuff there and I'll bring it back and share with you. And Megaton said, it's cool. And he's just like, yeah, I don't want to train with anybody but Megaton. And I said, well, I think then what we could do is maybe your dad will let us put, we had mats that Megaton sold us that I bought like for 400 bucks. He sent me a tarp and some foam. And I said, let's put the mats in your basement and if we charge everybody that's training with us like 40 bucks, we can split it with your dad. And then I could use the money to travel and train and keep learning. And he goes and tells Megaton, uh, I think in his own way, I, I, I've never talked to him about it. I don't really care to, but he, I think he told him, um, cause me and him are good now we're friends, but, um, I think he told him like, Hey, Jeff's just kind of in this for business or something like that. And I was like, and then, um, I flew out to Arizona and he, he was told that I was going to train with Carlson Gracie jr. And I was just trying to make money and in this for all the wrong reasons is what he took because it was a, his English was poor. You know, he wasn't able to maybe translate what Tom was explaining or, or whatever. Uh, so I, I get out there and we used, I used to go to Arizona to train with him and then we would drive to California and we would train at like Joe Marrero's Academy and, just different places in on the West coast. 
well, this time I got out there and I had a two week trip planned and I was only like, maybe I was early senior year in high school and I got out there and I had maybe 50 bucks on me for the whole week. And he, he didn't pick me up at the airport. And I spoke to him a few days earlier and he said, he'll be there. And he had all my information. Um, anyway, this is not a short version. It's getting to be longer, but what happens, he ends up, um, basically makes the announcement in class. He's going to be going to go to California for the next couple of weeks and train and blah, blah, blah. And then he, I looked at him like, well, what about me? And he was ignoring me in class. And he's like, kept ignoring me. Then he let me come to his house and in the middle of the night. He like woke me up and made me sleep on the, get off the bed and sleep on his carpet floor with no blanket, no pillow. And I was like, what the, I was like crying all night. Like, what is going on? Like this guy, I worship him. And then we get in the car the next morning. He's not talking to me. And we get to the boys girl club where his academy is and class wasn't for like a couple more hours. And he told me, he's like, you can train class, but then you need to go home. Um, and I said, why are you being like this? And he's just like, oh, and you can just go home and train with Junior. And I was like, whatever. So I wrote him a long cussed out letter <laughs> and 20, left 20 bucks for class and slid it under his door. And then I had no money to really take a taxi or anything like that. So I started rollerblading to the airport, which is like three hours on skates. <laughs> And about two hours in, a cab driver saw me like just through this bad neighborhood and he picked me up and he got me to the airport and it took me maybe another day and a half to get home. I had to get my, somehow find someone back home with a credit card. No one had credit in my life um, and buy me a ticket and find a flight. It was a mess. So I just came home just kind of pissed off and that's when I joined Carlson Gracie team. And then when Junior left about a year later, he moved away. I was like, man, what if what's going on? I just want to find somebody to mentor me. So it was kind of like a weird thing because loyalty is huge to me. You have to, you know, you should be loyal to the people that are devoting their time to you. That doesn't mean not train with other people. That means no, come home, you know, when you're done, come home and share with the team and give back. Well, I was kind of felt like later, like I can see why Megaton was upset with me. He didn't understand what, what was going on. And, you know, back then, I think a lot of people were trying to take advantage of um, people that did jujitsu and black belts and vice versa. You know, black belts were trying to take advantage of people with money and um, profit and whatnot. So I learned a lot from it. And, you know, it was kind of one of those things. Where once I met Pedro, I was like, thank God, you know, somebody that not only teach me jujitsu, but can mentor me through uh, the behavior necessary to be able to learn jujitsu and share jujitsu and, and all of that. So it just was a messy time as a kid. And my dad passed away when I was 18, uh, a few months before I met Pedro for the first time. And it was just a great timing. They were the same age and I was kind of in need of somebody to kind of give me some direction. Otherwise who knows the, the path I would have taken would have maybe been just a little, I don't know, opposite. Uh, that's an amazing story though, because, and I also think that when you go through, um, trials and tribulations like that, you know, it forges your spirit and it, and it turns you in, uh, it, it makes something within you. Uh, who knows? You may not have ever accomplished all you accomplished if you didn't battle that first. Yeah. And it was, um, it was cool because, well, when I was a purple belt, I saw a megaton walk behind me when I was getting on a scale at, at, in North Carolina, the pro -Am. So It was the first time I had seen him. And I was like, Oh man, I want to fight him. And I was, I was fighting MMA and I was like, I'm going to, I was ready to pick a fight with him. That's how I was. And then I was like, I'm just going to shut my mouth and look away and blah, blah, blah. Years go by, years go by. Um, I see him at the, I see him at the master worlds and he was a totally different person. You know, I know that he joined Gracie Humaita. I know Hoyler um, maybe was a great influence on him. Everybody just kind of grew up and came out of it. And I, sat down with them and talked and eventually I had him and Pedro all in a little group and we were all talking and it was nice. And then shortly after the worlds, I competed against Gianni Grippo in a pro match and I broke my nose and I couldn't stop bleeding. And Megaton was in the locker room with me, helping me out. And afterwards at the hotel, he was the only one giving the attention. So it was cool. You know, him and Megaton and junior are both on really good terms with me. Um, 
we remained friends. Eventually, Meg and, Meg and I became friends, but uh, Junior, for sure, he's always been a great support and supportive of whatever I decided to do. So that taught me a lot, too, you know, to be forgiving of people if they choose a different path and whatnot. It's hard to, it's hard to swallow as gym owners, though, you know, when you have students you invest into that leave for no reason. It's kind of like, man, but I guess you got to see their side and, you know, remember where you come from. Yeah, I think for me, sometimes it's tough when they when there is a reason, but they don't tell you, and you find out about it later. It really had nothing to do with you, but maybe somebody else at the academy. Is that and that's the worst? Yes. It, it just don't know. It's not nothing you did, nothing that you could have stopped, and because you didn't even know what was happening, and then you find out about it later down the road. That's what bothers me. Yeah, it bothers me when like somebody that's like a higher ranked student, and you find out that like just general communication could have solved it. And instead, here you are, you're like, it, obviously, it wasn't that important for you to train under me that you weren't willing to have a conversation with it before you up it, upend your jujitsu journey and go somewhere else, you know? Yep. No, it's true. I had a person get all the way to almost black belt. They were like two to three stripe brown belt and um, was with me for years from white all the way to that point. And, uh, you know, not, it wasn't even mad at me. They were mad at somebody else. <laughs> and they just quit, walked away. It's the worst. You could write a book. You know? There's so many stories. And I just try to remind myself, like, when I was younger and when I was going through certain things in my life, uh, then I maybe make worse, you know, bad choices. Or maybe I would, if I were to be back in that situation now, I would think, wait, 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 wait. Meg, Megaton, let's talk. This is what I can we work this out? You know, like now back then I was just like, eh, I'm gone. You <laughs> treat me like that. I don't need this. You know, it's so. funny because Rob always gives me like the, the advice in because I, I, I still have that little bit of like my ass gets chapped when I see like a purple belt leaf. And it's like, you've worked so hard with them and you've put so much effort and time into them. And then all of a sudden they're just like, yeah, I'm going over here. Yeah. Like, what the fuck? And Rob's like, it's going to happen. People are going to choose their path. They're going to walk their way. And it's like, you can't get upset. You have to realize how much time you put into someone. Like, it's, that's a tough one for me. So It is. And what I had one of my students, uh, you know, without getting into it, the specifics of it, because specifics would give it away. And I don't want to throw anybody under the yeah. bus. When I dealt with the situation of one of my students, I called, I remember calling Pedro. I'm like, oh my God, man. And I, I don't bug him with things because I can already, I already know the answer, but I needed to hit, hear him say it. And he's like, man, little Jeff, just, just remember, support whoever it is, let them go because they gonna, is, the most important thing is that they keep training jujitsu and they find, a, they find a home that fits them better. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, yeah, all right. Bite my tongue. <laughs> like, all right, I'm going to go with it. And it's, you know what it is? It's such a, it's relieving. Uh, you feel like you're not a prisoner to this like feeling of like, feeling like you're let down if you can let that go a little bit. And, you know, we know Pedro has been screwed so many times by people in his life. He's had people leave for no reason, say this, say that, here, say this, here, say that. And he's still forgiving. He's still just like, man, that's just some, we put too much faith in what people are going to do when they're in certain situations. And we need to understand that not everybody's perfect. And, you know, so it's, for me, it's very difficult because I just want to, you know, bitch everybody out and, <laughs> Oh, I like God. it though when they come back. I've had a few leave thinking, you know, whatever. And then they, you know, a year goes by, six months goes by and they call the text. Hey, can I talk to you? I made a mistake. I want to come back, you know, and I let them come back. I don't, I don't hold it against them. Yeah. I mean, I've let, I've let a lot of people back more than once. Um, but then after a certain point, some people just, the actions, they just don't allow them. I don't allow it back. Um, for whatever reason, you know, it's like, a like the saying goes, if you put, when you're making lemonade, a little more lemon 
a little more sugar, a little more water, eventually you get the right mix. Mm -hmm. If it's too sour, add sugar. If it's too sweet, add water, whatever. But one drop of dish soap boils, ruins the whole thing. So you have, uh, with, with your students, and if like right now my energy in my gym before this was so good. Everybody in the academy was just supportive and on each other's sides. Nobody was causing drama. Nobody gets mad over little things. Everybody works together to solve problems. I got a great staff. Like every, the energy is the best it's ever been. And the second I get a guy that's causing bad energy, it's like, man, we're zero tolerance. You got to go. You just no, yeah, 100%. I agree. And it's funny because you're, the, you're not the only person that has mentioned that this right before this COVID thing hit, like our schools, our school was the best it had ever been. Wouldn't you agree, Rich? That, yeah. You know, right up until that last probably seven, eight, nine months a year up leading up to this. I mean, we were the most students you ever had, the happiest people have been. Ever, we were just perfection, really. And then it, almost too good to be true. And then bam, this thing hit. And I just hope we snap back with it. You know, all of us, you, us, everybody. I think we will. I've had a lot of people um, texting or calling and saying, even I just had another one today that's a past student and um, life had taken him away from training. He's like, you know, I wasn't even thinking about it so much until this whole thing hit and now I can't train and I want to. And he's like, when this is over, I'm coming back. So I've actually had people um, and some family members that are watching the Zoom classes have even said they've been, they've been trying it where before they might not have brought themselves into the academy, but within their own house, being able to do it over the Zoom it kind of opened their, uh, their eyes to the world of jiu-jitsu and to whatever. And now they want to come do it. So, and we might end up bouncing back stronger. I think we will bounce back stronger. I just don't know when that's going to be. Um, I mean, I, I was saying the other day, I'm like, I could see this going like five different ways, you know, and, but I'm erring on the side of caution that like maybe taking a little bit extra time is better for the long run than, trying to rush in the second we get a chance a second the governor says go ahead and we can somehow finagle ourselves into this phase or that phase i'm not necessarily sure that's the best move for us because we have such a large scale that the how am i going to accommodate everybody if i've got two three hundred members that are itching to come back and i have to do classes of ten and how many hours in a day are there? So I have a few ideas, but I would rather us just like not risk a resurgence that a little bit longer wait might go go better. Uh, but I think it's still too soon. I mean, Chicago, we are grouped in Illinois. We're grouped with uh, Chicago. We're like the northwest tip of the perimeter that they drew where we have to follow the Chicago guidelines any further than us you start getting into really small rural towns and even though we're small we're still you know we're still a little bit more populated than everybody else so we have to follow suit to whatever the city of Chicago says and you know it's I, I, I see it like if it rebounds against us we're gonna all the whole industry is in a in a bad spot you know mm -hmm. but if we can all kind of like take it slow then maybe we've got a chance of getting through this year and next year could be different but medically speaking as soon as we have all that worked out i think there's three things they say like treatment uh, treatment testing and vaccine man once those are in place then i think we're good but ultimately i think it comes down to just having a strong immune system and being healthy. And uh, maybe this is an eye opening thing for a lot of people that, you know, Hey, I have to do what I got to do to not that the coronavirus is not going to attack somebody and kill somebody that is healthy, but the high percentage of the people have underlying issues. So anything we can do to, you know, to mitigate that, unfortunately guys, you know, as you know, like if you have cancer, cancer is, um, going to attack healthy people the same way it's going to attack not healthy people cancer is cancer so not everything is preventable but uh, and we do have to do our part to protect the vulnerable and, and uh, the higher risk but beyond that eventually the world does need to open back up right
No, no, yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's good. It's one of those things where there's no crystal ball to look into to see what the perfect scenario is going to be. It's kind of uncharted waters. <laughs> so, go, so switching gears a little bit, we had mentioned it a little bit in the beginning there. Those, uh, it was the VHS, DVDs, whatever, early on with the white to blue, blue to purple. Um, what year were those done? Uh, I was a brown belt probably about 18 years ago. 18 years ago? And, and, and like I said, every, probably every member of every affiliate worldwide has watched those repeatedly over the years. Then you get these camps where everybody shows up. Is it, is it kind of like uh, people kind of assume they know you just by watching the videos? <laughs> yeah, if they're watching the videos, they know who I am. Um, of course, I never have one speaking part. <laughs> just getting beat up the whole time. Uh, but that you know mixed with some of course some people involved in jujitsu obviously follow mma and you know so you get a little bit of a maybe overlap in that regards where they are aware but just also i've been a part of pedro's association since i was since that time i mean i i've been with pedro now 25 years wow. it's 25 25 26 years so the videos go back about, may, let's just say 18 years, they go back. Uh, I retested for my blue belt with Pedro, and then I tested for my purple belt. I got my purple belt, and then I got my brown belt. And then the day after I got my brown belt, he sent me out to compete against this heavyweight <laughs> brown belt under Helsin. And uh, I got triangled right away. So I was like, what are you making me compete for? Anyway, so I had this like uh, – I was a brown belt for a pretty good time too. So somewhere in the realm of being a brown belt, we filmed those videos in my academy and my partner, Chuck, who is filming my videos still today and, and my partner in my gym, he filmed with like three or four camera angles and he'd never filmed before and he'd never done editing before. So he spent the next like year of his life editing those videos out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he had like that sound of the, the broken glass before each, before each. Yeah. Uh... At, at the time, Pedro was like, man, that's really cool. Like everyone, eats. now it's like, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, oh. you know, I'm so happy to have been able to do it. And then we, we, so we filmed the white, the blue, blue to purple. And then I went back, I went back there, like I, I went by maybe a year two years, year and a half ago, I went and Mike, Mike Horan refilmed. We were supposed to refilm white to blue, blue to purple. And it went a totally different direction, man. Pedro just, he starts going on. Like to give an example, Mike said, okay, Pedro film, uh, the basic is escape with a mount, just a trap and roll, like a UPA escape. And it became like this, 25 minute video of like all these little tricks and gems and he got done and he's sweating and he looks at me and looks at mike mike's like that's good it's good now can you just do it like spend like a minute or two just showing it keep it real basic and it was doing it was so good it's like just like this and then see look and then here i can catch the arm and then if the arm's not there i got this and went on another 10 minutes so we filmed for like five days probably six to eight hours a day tons of good stuff re basically advanced basics and then he wanted to film the alio gracie books so we filmed that and it was just like it, i don't know we were supposed to reboot the white the blue blue to purple but it just went a totally different direction and it's all gold but um that was that is that now, gonna come out it started to be up there i mean you if you go to if you're on his site you'll see the newer version, newer videos with his yellow mats and black, uh, Ava Gracie's hanging in the background and me and him drill, uh, doing the moves. I don't know how Mike's labeled it or titled it, but it's mm -hmm. definitely there and it's all really good stuff. Um, it's just, we wanted to do move for move, white to blue, blue to purple and just update it, you know, and get rid of the broken glass. And <laughs> it was like, we went in a different direction, but. Yeah, it is there. I've seen quite a few of them. The self-defense ones are great. Um, they're all great. But I mean, uh, I, I think you're right. It wasn't packaged in the way that it could be a quick resource for students. It was 
like a, yeah. a long right yeah tons of stuff i mean and if you filter it out but the white to blue blue to purple man that that is golden for sure um i've thought about rebooting them um but i've just i've been working on my online for because of this lockdown i'm able to build my online uh library myself and i'm excited to launch that and you know have kind of my own little fun project to work on and now when is like, that going to come out jeff uh oh, man i'm hoping we're going to just have to do it in phases because there's so much content and i think the first phase will go by the end of the month like the site itself is 95 percent done there's a few like edits and stuff like that and photos i'm trying to fit find and um the navigation of it's really cool like um the guy that's doing programming for me is every little thing that i want he's getting done so it's it's kind of cool you know and i feel the stress of it like i hope it's good you know but uh i'm hoping to launch it and the, the it'll launch the end of this month hopefully and then it'll go I have my striking basics on there, like uh, fundamental curriculum for upper body offense, upper body defense, lower body offense, lower body defense. And then I got my BJJ fundamentals uh, that I run here at my, at my class, which I referenced in there a lot. You know, this is, it's 99% the, the stuff that we do on Pedro stuff. It's the same stuff. It's just modified to my, how uh, the things I've made adjustments with, you know, I've been training jujitsu almost 30 years and things just are these days a little different for me than maybe they, they were when I filmed those videos. So um, I just made a little updated version, my rendition of things. Um, then I have a lot of series that I'm doing like front headlock series, volume one, front headlock series, volume two, uh, butterfly guard, everything. I mean, it's, the library is going to be big today. We shot for like four hours and all I got done was pendulum sweep with six, six or seven variations and troubleshooting. And then I did, um, the gift wrap sweep, arm drag sweep, five variations and gift wrap sweep, two or three variations. And it's like, they all kind of interconnect. And now I filmed for like four hours before we got on this call and little by little, we're just kind of plugging away and, you know, putting things up there. So and that's going to be Jeff TV. Yes. Is that the site? Yep. Oh, that's good. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, right now you, have, you, you can access Pedro's stuff. Uh, man, so much footage. Like I filmed a lot of stuff for Mike. It's, I'm going to keep filming stuff for Pedro's and you know, I'm, this is not like, a an association based thing. This is me be trying to just reach people around the world and my students that I want to, people that want to learn from me and don't get a chance, you know, that's just my way of categorizing and stuff like that. And obviously not being in competition with Pedro's association and what he's doing, because there's, you know, a totally different level of software there that can track progress and track classes and attendance. And, you know, I don't have that kind of setup. Mine is just a subscription based, Thing with good navigation to find positions and moves and you know categories and whatnot so yeah the system, more, the, go ahead sorry rich go ahead more like an encyclopedia of what you can accomplish yeah it it's gonna be i think like a, a good way of putting it um just like it's my story you know it's if i were to teach jujitsu to somebody start to finish it's not going to be, oh, go to Jeff's site and you're going to see all the latest Barambolo moves and all the, you know, 10th planet stuff. Like it's my stuff that works for me, stuff that I teach. It's techniques, philosophy, everything that I believe in and I stand behind. And, you know, it's I, the way I put it in one of the intro videos for one of the programs is that you go, if you study somebody's style of jujitsu, let's just say, I don't know, uh, Kyle Terra. If you study Kyle Terra's version of jujitsu, it's very good. And he's, you know, he's submitted me. I'm not going to say he's not good. He's great, but maybe, and he, this is totally just an example. Maybe Kyle's style of jujitsu or Barambolo, if you're a Barambolo style guy or you, or Eddie Bravo style, 
it might not work for everybody. You can grab some moves. I feel like all of those other styles, if you have like a, a fancy game or you have a very limber game, my stuff's going to, my jujitsu, because it's old school, basic with little twist, it's going to fit everybody. You know, it's just same thing with like nothing you learn from Pedro Sauer is going to be like, oh man, I can't do that. You know, he can, well, he, and he can personally do it, some crazy stuff. But his, if you learn jujitsu from him, you don't need to do crazy stuff. But you can add the crazy stuff to it, no problem, because every other style gets complemented by that level of a style. And I feel that that's my style is you can be any other style of jujitsu and take what I say and make it work without changing your game. I think right now it's like, and probably even like five years ago is when there was so much information. And then with everything that's happening now, it's even more information being put out there. So it's yeah. like you have new people that are starting jujitsu and it, there's so many memes and all these other like things that we laugh about where the white belt comes in. It's like, Hey man, here's the arm bar. No, 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 no. I, I want to see the inverted barambolo to a 50, 50. And you're like, do an arm drag and an arm bar. <laughs> yeah. So it's like to have something that fits more people that are coming into the martial art. I think it benefits so many of the new guys. It's definitely a solid foundation. Uh, you know, even today, like when I talked about the pendulum sweep, I show a drill that t teaches the mechanic. I teach the standard option, the most standard version or variation that you could do and what the mechanics do and, how to make sure you don't lose position after the sweep and so on. And then I start going into a couple more setups and then you're going to have the higher you climb, you're going to have guys shut you down by doing this. So here's some ways to troubleshoot. And then beyond that, you know, the, you're going to have to just explore jujitsu. I can't answer every question in one video, but later as life goes on, I might go, Hey, you know what? I've been doing this from the pendulum sweep. Let's film this and put it in that category. And then it can be there. And again, I'm not, nothing that I show is going to be a made up move, a move that doesn't work for me or something that I don't believe in 100%. It's just, and it might not be 10,000 moves, but it's going to be a big library and you're definitely going to get to understand uh, at least how I think. And, and man, I think, I think people are going to like it. You know, it's going to, they're going to today, my Brown belt Kyle, when we were done filming and Kyle's a, killer like kyle he'll tap me a lot you know we train all, all the time together and you know he the other day he i said oh it's three zero he goes you're what you're keeping a score <laughs> you know he tapped me like a uh, head and arm choke and then a couple leg locks and like by the end of the training i'm like all i wanted to do was tie it up like in my head i just want to be um those competitive roles that we've been able to get because, you know, he's staying quarantined with me and stuff like that. We've been getting one or two rolling sessions in a week, but today he said, you know, the saying, I think he said, like, you've taught everything. You've taught me everything I know. This is him saying this to me is you've, I've learned not realized now you've taught me everything I know, but not everything, you know? So he's like, it's so he's so into the filming because I'm as I'm showing some details and mechanics, he's totally getting into it. Like, man, I never knew that. That's awesome. And then offset off camera, we're spending more time going over stuff because I'm teaching him like why I'm doing what I'm doing and make sure he understands it. So I think that's the fun part. And then of course I learn about it too. And we came up with a little move afterwards. I'm like, Oh, this could work. Let me play with it. You know? And then if we like it, we'll film it later. So Oh, it's got to be about probably, I think it's a year ago now, this week, because uh, I went down to Virginia for police week last year. And um, you taught a whole series, butterfly guard into the under, uh, overhook. Uh, I'm sorry, underhook control on the AC. Okay. Across. Yeah, this exactly. Yep. Yeah. To this day, I, ever since I left there, I drilled the hell out of that. Th I use that constantly. Like that whole, and I've seen like, obviously it's been around for years because I you know Marcelo and Gordon Ryan's been using it. But yeah. that, I, I had never formally been taught the series you did. And, and, and that was, that like sold it for me. I'm like, that's, that's fantastic. So much control there. And what I like about that is it works grappling. It works with strikes. It works like across the board. Yep. And so that's like the, the, the shoulder bite 
will be a series in my on my site as well where i teach the stuff that you saw and then some you know because it's been a while since i taught that version of it and anything that comes and goes with it but the cool thing that i'm doing and i'm it's it's taking time but because it's only because i'm filming all the time and i'm in the mindset i'll give pointers in a video i'll say like okay so guys right here class 24 of the fundamentals curriculum you'll see where I'm talking. I'm teaching this basic, like sliding into the pocket of the hip drill. So if you haven't seen that, go reference that, watch that fundamental video where I teach that version or that move that's necessary to make this move work. Or when I'm teaching the front headlock volume one, I'll say, and right here, you can connect into taking the back. Be sure if you wanna really optimize this position, watch my back series one, two, and three. And then from there we can go on. So that shoulder bite, works into the front headlock. It also connects into the back and everything about it just kind of like, and then my butterfly guard and my, I think it's the, what is it called? The butterfly half, mm -hmm. like the butterfly guard and the half. That's what I taught uh, when I was out by um, the headquarters last. And it's a cool little series back and forth. All of these fit together and then you leave and you have a, a system down where you at least have the like you're understanding this position now differently than you did before but all it's done is enhance your game you didn't have to change your style for it if it's there you're like okay cool plug it in trap the arm and now you're off to the races if it fails you're right back where you know into your other into your other game so that's the thing about it is i'm making this like one long storyboard of connections of systems and series that will hopefully just tell one big story when you're done and um kind of a big mind map if you will like just spread out and connected like one of those old flow charts in a sense oh yeah that's, that's good you know you know greg wood greg wood's uh, in the association he's a black belt um he, Who's that? he does greg wood he does mind maps and he and he, he showed me years ago got he's got his entire wall in his basement every position every place you can go off of that position yeah, it's amazing. Like he literally broke down every part of jujitsu that he knows on the wall. Yeah, that's Kyle. Kyle's that way too. He's just like he'll pull up his little app and he'll show me like, look at this. You know, this move goes to here, and then whoop, you sweat to here, and then this move comes up, and now look this big web. And I'm like, man, just let's just <laughs> go to the mat, and I'll just do it. So, yeah, it's it is. It's a virtual or uh, it's like a virtual mind map, you know, I'm not, I'm not spending a lot of time with like type, typing up text to go along with each video or um, doing a lot of like fancy graphics. The move comes in, I show it, I show it slow motion, I show it silent, I show it repetitively with a partner then you know sometimes it's slow motion without any talking um i talk I, I elaborate on the positions a lot and you know i think that the good you don't need a whole lot of written just because you can go back and keep watching it but um the second phase i will tr probably take down like my series and my curriculums and and add like some written text to reinforce it for the people that can learn from like the from reading as opposed to just watching oh, that's good so i'm curious we uh we talked about like way back and it's like how jujitsu was and you know we kind of touched on the whole area of like you know training with other people and cross training and how that was really kind of taboo and really looked down on mm -hmm. now jump to right now where do you see jujitsu going? It's like, it seems like, especially with like a lot of the competitor side, it's going towards like, uh, you know, with Gordon and uh, Gary Tonin. And it's like Nikki Rod with a lot of talking, a lot of WWE almost, you know, I'm kind of curious to your take on that right now with the competition side. Uh, not a fan. <laughs> you want to be the best in the world that you're the best in the world be the best in the world um i don't know i but at the same time the financial opportunities that are coming the way of some of these guys you can't blame them i guess it's their 
their livelihood. Um, you know, I'm going to have to plug my phone in, um, change angles. Hopefully the, the light isn't too bad, but, um, you know, the, I'm not a fan for, for sure. I'm not a fan of that. Uh, I'm not a fan of that in MMA. I was never really a shit talker. Um, if I heard things were being said, or if I felt like I had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder, I might be like, you know, this guy's got nothing for me. I'm coming for him, but that's fighting. You know, I never been like this guy's this and his mom's this and this guy, you know, like I'm not gonna, I just was never that person. I feel like a lot of this attitude that people have like that, when they start being the example for students and they have to be, a role model for people in that regards, um, you, you start changing how you act. You start changing how you, the things you say, because, you know, parents don't want to bring their kids here if they're not most parents, at least, uh, if they think their kid's going to just learn how to be an asshole and talk shit. Um, so, yeah, I feel like <laughs> uh, it's not well, for me. It, it's interesting because you hear the, the two sides of the coin where they sit there and say, well, so-and-so is talking all this shit and whatnot, but that's not really them. They're really a good person behind it. But yeah. the masses of millions see this and then being an asshole. Only their students in their academy see them as, you know, the person or the, when they go to a seminar, but it's like the masses are seeing this persona of what's out there. And that's what's kind of a, a infecting the new people coming into jujitsu yeah uh it's a show <laughs> it's a show and I, like conor mcgregor i know like if you watch his earlier fights he just well spoken he's charismatic i was a big fan but when it goes to a certain point of just theatrics i just lose interest because then i just feel like we're going down that realm of uh the wwe and um, or people of our generation at WWF. <laughs> yeah, WWF, exactly. You know, before it uh, changed. Now, what was your, you fought in a lot of organizations. Uh, mm -hmm. Just a couple more questions. I know you're probably, I don't want to keep you all day. Um, what was your favorite organization to fight for? Well, the, the WEC was by far my favorite. Uh, they were Zufa owned, the UFC owned them. Uh, so the staff was the same. So I would say the UFC and the WEC equally were the same. Uh, there was a few different staff members and like executives that helped out with the WEC that really just made it fun. To, you felt like you were a part of something because the lightweights were finally getting on the map. And I was a featherweight during the the first half of my run there before dropping to bantamweight and that it was, it just felt like you were a part of that um movement and so we just yeah i think wc was probably my my most favorite organization to fight for they were it was a good vibe and just good energy all around and i wish they would have never changed over to the ufc but it was good for overall What's your most memorable fight for you? The worst fight ever was probably my most memorable, and that's when I got submitted by Uriah Faber. <laughs> oh, yeah. it's, the, it's the only fight that I've been submitted in MMA ever, and uh, my whole world just crashed after that. Uh, I made bad decision after bad decision after bad decision. I also – and it was – Mo they weren't just like I'm running around being an idiot doing bad decisions it was like a lot of it was bad decisions on maybe business I needed to do this with my business or I needed to do this with my career I needed to fight this person so it wasn't all just like personal bad decisions it was just um there was some of that but it was just more or less just uh I felt like I don't know I felt like what I'll never get back to where I need to be. And it just started it. It started this like downward spiral of my career. Um, I continued to fight the best guys, but I would like lose split decisions. And eventually I got cut from the WEC and I felt like I was improving and even getting better and better as time would go, go by. And 
I just didn't feel like I needed to be cut. And then I got cut and just, it's when the emotionally fighting just really started to beat me down because prior to that, if I would lose a fight once in a while, I would, I was able to handle it. You know, I could get by with it. But when I lost that, I think I knew I was losing something much bigger than a fight. It was a, it was a title fight for one. And I think that would have just set up my life a little bit differently to have the momentum I needed to move forward. But instead I was just like, man, I got to fight the best guy next. I got to fight the number one. So they feed me Mike Brown and I'm like, okay, I'll fight Mike Brown. He was the Bodog lightweight champion, I think coming down to 45. So then I fight him in the WC and then, after him, I felt too small, so I dropped to 35, and I fought Joseph Benavides, and then I lost a split decision in Chicago to him in front of my whole 10,000 Chicago fans. And then I fought Mizugaki, and I felt like I won that fight, and then I got lost a split decision, and I got cut. So the Uriah Faber fight is like the catalyst to this whole process. And you just I never once stopped believing in myself. It just... Uh, started feeling like man what the fuck you know like what if, what do i got to do differently what is out to get me that i cannot get past this cusp anymore so that's the most now, memorable were you running your academy all that whole time too because to try oh, yeah. to run an academy and be a pro fighter i mean that's a tough balance well i was running the academy uh i was promoting an mma show called the xfo full-time I was training a team of probably 45 guys and I had guys in the WC guys in the UFC. I had guys in Bellator, I had guys in every other small promotion across the country. And every single weekend I was cornering. So I would go corner one weekend, fight the next corner the next five weeks in a row. And at the same time, holding pads for people, being their sparring partners, even when I wasn't. And this was since I was 20 years old when I started my school. Uh, I started my school six months before my first fight. So I now I've been running my gym 23 years. I've been having my academy. And the whole time I I've, I've fought and competed, I still had to teach class. I still had a lot of financial stress then. Everything was financially against me. So... I really should have just lightened the load in my and had a simpler operation, but I just kept trying to be bigger and grow. And it was good. It was good for ex us to do what we did, but now I'm kind of exhausted from it. And I just want to teach jujitsu and train and, um, you know, one step at a time, kind of like that. And, but now, and now I think now would be the perfect time for me to fight, but now it's too late. <laughs> will we see you, will we see you in a grappling match again, maybe? Yeah, I plan. I was I was scheduled for fight to win again um, before this lockdown happened. Uh, I just plan on doing whatever I feel like doing um, at, when the time is right. You know, I I still talk about fighting MMA, but I don't think there's any opportunity. I'm going to be 43 this year, and there's no money. So unless they have something major come up, uh, now seeing Mike Tyson talk about fighting bare knuckle boxing at age 53 it's like man the bar keeps getting raised now i gotta be thinking about fighting till at least 53 you see him hit the pads did you see that video oh yeah it's yeah scary the, the side by side for when he was out of shape and now he's in shape again like how heavy he got when he was doing his stand-up show and uh compared to what he is now so he you know that's the thing like i could go fight today and i would i could probably in a, probably a month's time of just basic training and hitting mitts and sparring and I could probably go out and fight against guys of in the in the top 20 and still hold my own and do well but I don't know like I don't I wouldn't get, be given that opportunity considering the way my career was ending uh, I would need to like build myself some wins on a lower level to get back there but the big shows don't want old guys unless they're already signed so it's too much of a liability so i'm just kind of like and my wife does not want me fighting again um yeah. my little boys do they want me fighting um uh, they want to just be in my corner one time in their life but they don't understand the risk you know that i have to go through to, to do it but i think it'll never it'll never be like 
I, I had never fought MMA. I, you know, done grappling co- competitions and stuff. And, but I was a SWAT team member for 18 years. And mm-hmm. I can imagine there's some parallels. Like, it would be the excitement of me getting prepared for the, whatever hit we were going on and waking up in the middle of the night and getting dressed up and riding that armored vehicle with strap yeah. and everything and hit the door, flashbang, boom, go through the door, getting some murder suspect or something. And that's a high that you cannot recreate in anything else I've ever done. But yet, you know, now that I'm gone from that, but I always chase it in my mind. Like I'll never have that day again, but it's hard to say I won't. You know what I mean? No, I know exactly what you mean. And I would go through these when I, I retired, I think four times in my life, uh, maybe three and a half, I'll call it. Uh, one was kind of like a forced soft retirement. And then, uh, because something with my brain and then I realized I was okay and I got some clearance. So I went back, but, um, you know, the, when I would go through these feelings of like, man, whoa, I've got to do this. I would call Frank Cucci and Frank being a retired Navy SEAL, you know, for so many years, you know, probably a decade and a half, he was a SEAL team member uh, active. And, um, I said, man, what, how do you, do you ever feel this way when you, he's like, Oh, every day, you know, and because he was used to that feeling of going out and, um, you know, doing missions and things like that. And he told me, you know, you might want to think about seeing a doctor or getting on antidepressants. And I'm like, oh, you know, I was just going to internalize it and shove it down deep and deal, deal with it. So um, family helps, you know, having bigger th- things to work for than my own, um, I guess my own accolades or my own accomplishments is the real key because if I didn't have my family to work for and to build a future with for ourselves and for them, I would be way more self-destructive and I would just be fighting. So um, they saved me in that regards. And that definitely keeps me um, heavy on the heavy on the wheel going down the right path because uh, otherwise I would be like, I would be calling my manager every day being like, you got to get me a fight or I'd be calling promoters and, I still sometimes have to be talked down because I do like to fight and I do feel like I still can. Um, there's just something about it. Like you said, you go out and you're accomplishing something so intense, just being out there. It's, it's a hard feeling to recreate in your life and sport jujitsu doesn't do it for me like that. Uh, sport jujitsu is something different. I live for in the mindset of just like, I want my jujitsu to shine. I want to do well. And, um, it's a different intensity, but fighting is just like, it's a scary thing. You know, it's like something that you have to be really strong willed and, and in your, I shouldn't say strong will. You have to be okay with yourself being afraid all that time. And when you're, when you get through that, there's something that changes in you as, as a person, even fight to fight for me. Every time I fought, I would come out and I would feel like I was a better person because I got through it or a stronger person. So that self, that self fulfillment is not just about winning or money or a title or something like that. It's just like, wow, I did this, you know? Yeah. And you have to be, you have to be okay knowing that you may not be okay. (laughs) And you don't know that yet. You have to be okay knowing going in there, you could truly get hurt or even, or even die. And then that, that high that you get from that, it's tough to replace, you know, but um, you have something else going on. I want to ask you about before we get going Uh. You got the BJJ retreats. When did you start doing that? And I really wanted to go to that one in Clearwater this year, but I got, I got kind of sick in the winter. I couldn't go. Uh, are you going to keep doing those? Yeah. Oh, God, I hope everything opens back up. My, my February one for Daytona is up in the air right now. I, have, I was planning on doing uh, rock, or the Smoky Mountains in the fall, mm-hmm. a, cabin, a cabin that sleeps like, um, I want to say – 55 people in the Smoky Mountains and then a little outbuilding that we would train in. So I had that one, but that one obviously couldn't happen. And then my Daytona Beach one that's scheduled is just on hold. Uh, But once a year, for sure, we're going to Florida every third week or so of February. Uh, I just had the idea when I I did the jujitsu cruise with Pedro, uh, the grapplers escape, me and the owner of that discussed maybe doing one on land. And as we were talking about it, she, uh, you know, we kind of moved forward on it. And then as I looked into it, I'm like, you know what? I want to do something really affordable. And if there's two people involved that can't be affordable, um, 
I don't want to make too much money off of each person. Let's just grow in the strength and numbers kind of thing. So I did a sample one up north and my friends, uh, one of my friends had a hookup at a lodge there at a motel. And that was a pretty cool time in the dead of winter up like upper Wisconsin, probably about six hours from here. And freezing cold blizzard, but nobody cared because we were just inside the lodge training all day long. And at night we'd go to the bar and grill and eat and party a little bit. And then on we had a UFC night or the UFC, they aired the UFC for us. And that was my first retreat ever. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm going to keep doing this. So I did one more up north and then I went Cocoa Beach, Daytona Beach, Clearwater Beach this year. And then I was, I'm going to go back to Daytona because we really like Daytona and we have a good venue there that really works with us and allows me to help keep the cost down and stuff like that. But if we don't get to open up registration by the end of summer, I'm not going to attempt it because usually by now I'm already doing pre-sale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they're awesome. We had 95 people in Clearwater and I mean, it was just, it was just massive, just so much training. Um, lots of my black belt friends come out to these and help, help out and share. I had Cole Miller come teach and train the whole weekend with us. Mike Diaz, Dave Porter, Adam Miller, who I was talking about that I started under. Um, Joey Deal, myself, everybody there just digging in and sharing. So it's a good time. Yeah. We got to get out there, Rich. If he has another one. I'm, I'm definitely in for that. We got Kidding to go. me? Yeah. While we're down there, we'll visit our buddy Rob Khan when we go down. We have Rob's on the other yeah. side of the coast, but we'll go visit Rob. So, hey, Jeff, I really t appreciate you taking the time. I know you're a busy guy. You got a lot going on, and, and uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. And like I said, as soon as this clears, we want to get you back up here uh, for that seminar. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I appreciate you guys having me. Uh, always good to chat, and it's great to, uh, you know, break up the day a little bit. So, We'll be talking soon, and as soon as we get clearance to be back in business, I wish you guys the best, and I'll definitely be making my way out, out east. All right. Thanks a lot, Jeff. All right. Take care, guys. Yep, Good to meet you, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah, likewise.